Welcome, everyone, to another edition of the Creator Live podcast. I am super honored and really happy to be here again tonight. Uh, look, tonight we're going to have a special topic on creativity again. As you all know, we just finished the 2021 Creative Year Ever Summit in early January. And tonight we're going to continue that conversation based on some recent developments that I have uh, made since the summit. So, it, But most importantly, creativity is the backbone of content creation. Um, no matter what type of content you're creating, no matter what type of strategy you have, at the end of the day, it all takes a little bit of creativity. And it's, it's important because it applies to so many aspects of our lives and businesses every day. Creativity is key to solving problems that make an impact. Let's face it, um, everything we do usually requires some constant change, and creativity is the key to help you get to that point. And tonight, our guest is someone that I'm excited to bring to you as he can help us explain the logic behind the idea of creative thinking. I met our guest tonight during the Creative Year Ever 2021 Virtual Summit, as I mentioned, and since then, Dr. Robert Allen Black has enlightened me with some more important aspects of creative thinking that he has uncovered through his decade-long career, decades, I should say, with an S, decades-long career, devoted to researching, educating, and teaching this important topic. He's a global, he's a globe-trotting keynote speaker, trainer, and consultant, so let's, I'm honored to bring tonight uh, Dr. Dr. Black to the Content Academy Creative Life live stream. So let me, let me, I'm doing both the technical and the, the talking tonight. <laughs> so bear with me as usual. So bear with me. Let's get Dr. Black onto the screen here. And okay. um, Dr. Black, can I call you Alan? Is that okay? I would prefer you do. All I've right. used the full name. I've used it for 40 years for legal reasons and as a graphic designer for aesthetic reasons. When I had, I was one of the first to have a domain name mm. with Network Solutions and one of the first 100,000 website owners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all you had to do was type my name or my subjects in and you got me in any search possible. Now there are hundreds of Robert Blacks, Alan Blacks, Robert Allens, and so forth. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. some are prisoners, poets, rugby players all over the chart mm -hmm. but the good thing when you still type my name in you'll get now 200 to 600 thousand or million hits mm -hmm. the majority of the first 10,000 are me mm -hmm. so anyway mm -hmm. all that said yeah that's interesting and, and i i love your i love speaking of domain names i love your domain it's like it's it's create with the the number eight right or uh something like that right. tell, tell us exp, tell us your domain name if you don't mind it's creating.com and yeah. the creating was created because our state only allowed six characters on the license plate Mm. <laughs> and I have friends all over the United States who have different forms of the word creative. Mm -hmm. I wrote down create. I may not have been the first one, but I wrote it in 78. I didn't think to trademark it until many years later. And mm -hmm. some engineer in Oregon who, when I looked at his website, I didn't see anything creative, mm -hmm. but he had C-R-E-8-V or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Creative that way. The trademark office wouldn't give me create, even mm -hmm. though I could prove that I'd copyrighted it mm -hmm. 30 years before. It's mm -hmm. a, but yeah. unlike Disney and other corporations that have to really worry about trademarks and registration marks, I don't have multiple millions of dollars to fight people around the world for borrowing my word. <laughs> anyway, so it's... Yeah. It's an. It's also an acronym. I use acronyms for teaching. Mm -hmm. Learned that from Robert Schuler and others many years ago. The value of a simple word that people cannot forget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I used to wear, have a whole closet full of clothing with my logo in the rainbow colors, and people would stop me in the airplane in the airports and go, "That's us creating." No, I never thought of that possibility. Anyway. Yeah, speaking of All traveling the yeah, speaking of traveling the globe, I know you've gone around the world talking and teaching the concept of creative thinking, and right. through through my efforts of Creative Year Ever, I sort of try to expose the idea that you know um, creativity is key, and especially in this world that we live in today, that some may call the creative economy, if you will, um, and. 
I wanted to talk to you tonight to sort of you, – you've been enlightening me about this idea of creative thinking through our various conversations since the summit. So I was hoping that we could maybe give the, the world a little bit of a primer on what creative thinking is and how you approach that aspect. Okay. It came – I was co-writing an author, an article f with my major professor at the end of a study I did of a man that's known in creativity or has been for 40 years, Edward de Bono. My project was I was, to re I was going to read every book he had published. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the three-month quarter, I would write a paper which would be co-published with my major professor. I made a statement in the article when I showed it to him. It's the first time he ever got mad at me. And this was one of the humblest men I've ever known in my life. The greatest gift he gave me was his friendship. Not just calling me colleague or Dr. Black or any of that official stuff, but we were personal friends until the day he died. Mm. But he looked at the article and said, this is wrong. And I said, what's wrong? You wrote that I teach creativity. And I went, well, I thought that's what we were doing. He says, no, you can't teach what you cannot uniformly define. Mm -hmm. One of my Russian friends who's been an American for several years left Russia before the breakup and all that type of thing, but he eventually became American citizen. He wrote a, we, he guided it at a conference an audience of 400 people wrote a book about definitions of creativity in four and a half minutes. It's in Guinness Book of Records. Wow. They probably could have published it faster than they did, but it took, they had to drive into Pretoria to publish it. Uh, anyway, but the title of it is 101 Definitions. I have a couple websites on previous generations of my websites with hundreds. That's irrelevant. What you call creativity versus what I call. The key is it's different, unusual, unique, at least to you. Mm -hmm. But what I learned from Paul, and I've kept it minor, slight difference in definition, is I prefer to help people accept that they're creative and accept that they can learn to be more creative and that all human beings were born or are born with the capacity to creatively think. But their cultures, as Torrance would go on over 20 years, proving what he eventually called the fourth grade slump, because his tests can be given to preschoolers, kindergartners, and millions have taken his tests around the world. But studies have shown that a typical child in any culture of the world, I know of at least 93 personally that I've been to and found examples, their scores will plummet by the fourth grade, hmm. what he called the fourth grade slump. And one of the principles of standardized or industrialized education, as it's unfortunately labeled too often, is kindergarten is for fun. First grade, you start getting a little serious. Second grade, you get a little more serious. Third, you get more. In the fourth grade on, you're basically just learning more about what you already know. Mm -hmm. And teachers typically do not reward or encourage creativeness. Now, give me an example, which I've used around the world many times. What's one and one? Now, you would think, Oh, in school, that's two. I went, no, that's true, but it can be many other things. And I'll give you an example I came up with years ago and used as a gimmick to get people to remember it. A little girl in her pretty go-to-school dress, sitting in the front, does this. Mm-hmm. and says five. Teacher will immediately, in a polite way, because she's a cute little girl in a pretty dress, and it's her first day of school, might touch her, might not, that there's a lot of 
don't touch the kids in school yeah. syndrome that's been around for a long time might say to, well, Susie, no, one and one is two. Mm -hmm. She will not or he will not ask her, what were you doing, Susie? Because children are much brighter, like Einstein said. They're born geniuses and they're made not geniuses. Or Picasso talked about they were born great artists and they're taught not to be. You know, those are paraphrases of various quotes. But the teacher or an adult will not say, tell me what you were doing, Susie. Not use the word thinking because a five-year-old, that word is too abstract. True. What were you yeah. doing? Well, there's my mommy and my daddy. I don't know what happened there, but then there was me and my two brothers. So that means five. I've done that in cultures, whether I was using translators or no translators at all and using just nonverbal drawings and clues to communicate mm -hmm. and demonstrate. And one day when the internet was relatively new in 19... Oh, it would have been 88 or 89. You could get on the internet. There was no fancy commercialized thing, but you had to know how to get on. Yeah. But you could tell people ahead of time, here's the code for our chat group tonight. Sign on. Mm -hmm. I had people from 24 countries sign on that day. And I said, you have 24 hours to come up with as many ideas that may be provable, maybe not, but definitely possible. What's one and one? I have 224 on a website page on one of my early websites mm -hmm. to demonstrate. The problem is not the answer. The problem is the question. And that's another one of Einstein quotes, such and such words where he said, until you know the real problem, the, pro the question is hard. But once you know what the problem is, answers are easy. So creative thinking is sometimes reevaluating the question. Maybe. Yeah, re-looking at it. What else, what one and one? Well, the question the teacher means in English, what is the total sum of the quantity one added to the quantity one? Mm -hmm. That has, to the best of my knowledge, one answer, two. Mm -hmm. But one and one can be 11. If the kid knows something about Roman numerals, one and one can be two, yep. 50, mm -hmm. five, 10 and a few others. Mm -hmm. And that's the type of thing I do warm up people. Because as I said, you watch a two-year-old through about a seven or eight-year-old and you'll see lots of creativity mm -hmm. when there aren't adults around telling them what to do. Because so you notice the kid, one, I'm trying to remember which teacher wrote this. It was one of the education books I became obsessed in reading in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But he said, "What you know children are growing out of being a child when they look at each other to play a game and want to have to have rules. Because mm -hmm. the creative mind goes, Billy can't hit that well, so why don't we give him five strikes? And the other kids don't worry about that because they're not obsessed with competition and doing it perfectly. Yeah. So my premise is, as I was watching and listening to the sessions for your program that you invited, you offered as a gift to me, which I greatly appreciate. Mm -hmm. A lot of work went into that, a lot of sharp minds in that weekend. Is that people need to know that, hey, there's a lot of ways to create. Mm -hmm. You use the word logic. Mm -hmm. That's one way. And there's also winging it. Or one article and topic and approach I've used in workshops for several years. It is easier to get creative ideas if you start out silly. From silly to serious. Mm -hmm. It's harder to go from serious to silly. I, I could see that. Yeah. Makes sense. Some people can do it, no problem. But then you have the people that must have rules, must have citizens, mm -hmm. uh, systems. 
and the very flamboyant, intuitive kind of creators who are usually spotted and called the highly creatives because they generate hundreds of ideas. Mm -hmm. There's that one guy that comes up with one idea, but no one has ever done it before. Mm -hmm. it's true. One of the tests that two different versions, two different researchers in the 50s, one used circles, my major professor, the other one, his major professor, used squares. And what there were were blank, not blank sheets, but sheets with circles or squares on it. And the excitement for three minutes was do something with them. Mm -hmm. To the best of my knowledge, but I knew the principle of the test long before I started taking classes with Dr. Torrance. I have the highest score ever achieved on that, but that may not be true anymore. But I have one architect, extremely introverted, extremely quiet. He did one. And what you're measuring are a variety of things, but the four key things that researchers looked for originally was fluency, number of ideas, flexibility, number of different ideas, combination or hitchhiking of ideas, or uniqueness, or originality, that's another. Uh, freewheeling is a trait that is one that has to be taught to many people because mm -hmm. most people are so used to being corrected. Yes, but that's not how we do things around here. You know, in all the various things that are written about almost daily somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I focus on creative thinking. I can help you learn to think. And what do I mean by that? Is to generate or discover new ideas, at least new to you. That's a great point. It's a great point. So you and I, I kind of think I feel like I know your answer to this, but you talk about the education system and how it sort of um, programs people to maybe they, they call this a lot the industrial mindset, right? When we live when today we are more what I would consider a creative you know, creativity is more creativity has always been valuable, but even more today, in my opinion, um, how, you know, is there how could we undo what, the doing? You know, how are some kind of okay. aspects of undoing the doing? There are programs around the country. The most noted one was created by the man who came up with the concept called brainstorming. Mm -hmm. Alex Osborne. He was the creative director of BBDNO, still one of the largest, to the best of my knowledge, though they're not owned by any of the original partners. In fact, I knew his grandson who uh, worked for the company for a while. He came up with brainstorming it as a way of helping people become creative now. Mm -hmm. Not when the spirit was there, not when the muses were there, not when it felt right. I'm working eight hours a day as an architect or a graphic designer or an advertising director. I don't have time to wait for my muse mm -hmm. type of thing. When I went to the first creativity conference that I had been aware of called Creative Problem Solving Institute, it's the oldest, longest running. It was started by Alex Osborne originally oh, okay. mm -hmm. back in the early 60s. They're now in their 70th some year and they're virtual. They yep. created, they went the way they needed to. Right. But the thing is that you teach people that, yes, you can learn to generate more ideas. And there are literally hundreds to thousands of techniques. Are you familiar with the book called Thinker Toys? Like the uh, I'm Thinker, not actually. Yeah. No. Uh, I've lost it now. Oh. <laughs> it's Thinker, and I've lost the second word. Anyway, Michael McCulco mm -hmm. wrote this book. It's one of the best sellers in creative thinking ever written. What it is is an encyclopedia of creative thinking tools. Mm -hmm. In fact, seeing I can multitask here, I'll find it in a second when I get you talking again. 
<laughs> it's it's but, interesting. I kind of thought I, I should have a notebook next to me. I, I had a feeling that I'd be uh, wanted to write some stuff down during our, our conversation. Okay. But, but yeah, we can so, always come back to that. But I was yeah. listening to a fellow today who was selling himself as a creative creativity and innovation consultant. Mm -hmm. I won't go any further. There are hundreds to thousands of them, if not ten thousands or more of them around mm -hmm. the world. I know at least a couple thousand myself from the last 40 years who are still alive and still practicing. But he was coming from a totally rational, logical, this is the way it is. Science says it is this way. And yeah, he was to a point. But in reality, no. But he made the classic statement that I've challenged in public arenas several times, even with the editor of Psychology Today 20 years ago, when he said, brain research shows that brainstorming doesn't work. And I went, that's interesting, because I can show you hundreds of studies to prove that it does. Mm -hmm. But when you really examine the studies that claim it doesn't, they're not doing brainstorming. What they're doing is studying badly run meetings. Because mm -hmm. people who are taught to facilitate idea generation, which is what I prefer to use, the generic term instead of a particular tool, it will work well. Will it work as well with every group? No, there are too many variables. But typically I can walk into a mall when you could do that kind of thing yeah. and pick five people randomly and help them generate ideas, whether they've had training or not. Why? Because I've had extensive training. Mm -hmm. But I've got an article on one of my websites that statement is brainstorming. Do you mean what Alex Osborne invented or do you just mean badly run meetings? Because mm -hmm. people throw that word around. It's become a hackneyed cliche and so forth. So but just simple things like the first one, I wasn't even aware I was learning it. It was the fellow who created it. It's called Scamper. Scamper. Like the words you would say to, rep, to describe how a chipmunk or a squirrel moves or how kindergarten kids play in a room, mm -hmm. they scamper around. Well, they use that word because he was trying to teach children how to generate lots of ideas again mm -hmm. after they had been taught, don't do that. One and one always equals two. Mm -hmm type of thing. And what it is, is seven words that are verbs, action words, substitute, combine, adapt, alter, minify, modify, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, it is, I still believe, after all these years, it's the most used creative thinking tool probably in the world. And most people have no idea the name Bob Everly. Mm -hmm. And I've created some a system and the general term I had come across before, it's called checklist. In other words, you create a, a checklist. Okay. Goal setting, you know, time management, all kinds of organizational people have checklist. Well, my checklist is the alphabet of whatever language the audience is using. And I say, all right, you write the alphabet A to Z, all of those using English. Mm -hmm. And what I want you to do in your team is to write a profession or occupation next to every letter. Mm -hmm. If you don't get one for X, that's okay. If you don't get one for some of the others, that's okay. Do the best you can. You've got five minutes. Then we start working on a challenge. And I say, okay, what I want you to do is randomly pick five letters of the alphabet. And once you've done that, as a group, either independently or together, try to think like that profession. Mm -hmm. How would an architect do it? How might a computer website designer do it? How might a kindergarten teacher do it? And so forth. And once you'll end up with 26 different ideas, minimum. And I've done it with bankers as rigid as they could possibly be. Lawyers as I know everything. Yeah. Or even teenagers that often are even worse than lawyers. 
ha 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 there are a lot of good lawyers out there and a lot of very creative sure. ones mm -hmm. as my studies in the 80s and 90s were that i use a basic thinking style model that correlation studies with almost every model i've ever seen they're pretty much the same we just ask different questions to get the same result but mine i use the word mind m-i-n-d to represent four primary ways people tend to think mm -hmm. rationally with the m or the word i use is meditative mm -hmm. i is intuitive or with their imagination N is negotiative, a word that I believe I made that up. I'm not sure it's even in a dictionary. But it basically is the people that feel things. They're very people-focused. They're the extreme of extroverts. They're the people that walk into a room they've never been in before with a group they've never met before, and they can tell you the mood of the room. They can feel it. And then you have the D, or what I call directive, and these are the people that follow the rules all the time. And they must be highly structured, systematic. Yeah. And when I looked at pe some people as an example, most people are a combination of two out of the four or possibly three. Okay, We're so all capable. Real, I'm sorry, real Go quick, on. just to recap. So we have M-I-N-D, right? And these right. are the different types of um, sort of character Possible traits. Possible thinking people. styles. Okay. The M and the D are the left brain or what? classically is called the left brain the rational mind okay the i and the n are in the intuitive or the right brain once again uh, okay i use the brain dominance as a metaphor not hard science mm -hmm. okay. there's science out there showing some pretty strong evidence but it's been so meagerly done really mm -hmm. to make a fact saying this part of the brain does that's yeah. pushing it because some research has also shown the Eastern mind doesn't work like the Western mind. That listen to the music, listen yeah. to the music. And also research I read years ago, hopefully it was valid uniformly, is that Broca's brain, the Broca's brain, the little part of the brain that supposedly controls speech and language, mm -hmm. is not in the same spot in an Eastern part of the world brain. Hmm. It's interesting. And the tonalities of the West versus the tonalities of the East. Listen to Japanese music. Listen to Chinese music. A lot of Westerners can't mm -hmm. because the tone, I hope I'm using that word. I'm not a musician. Yeah. I enjoy <laughs> lots of kinds of music like what you were playing earlier that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. But what I want to do is I want to be able to teach my research and my dissertation was matching teaching with learning. Mm -hmm. And my principle, to me, it was obvious. If I'm French and you're Italian, and I only speak in French, chances are you're not going to learn a lot. No. But what have the Swiss done? They've learned all the languages. Mm-hmm. And usually, and of course, the ideal is the Dutch or the Netherlanders who usually speak, write, and read seven or eight languages. Mm -hmm. And that came because they were a culture of traders. Mm -hmm. And they had to learn the language. And then somehow people said, you know, if we all spoke English, it would be a lot easier. I'm being facetious on that one. Because <laughs> Russian was the Russian was the key language for a while mm -hmm. before English became the language. And when I traveled all over Europe to 24 different countries, having a first class Eurorail pass, the greatest gift was people who ride in first class speak English, mm -hmm. mostly, a lot. I mean, they understand it well enough. So I can talk to anyone. Mm -hmm. I discovered that firsthand. Type of thing. So, where do we want to go next? Because you can tell I don't give yes, no answer. No, and I, that's what I love about it. And and I think that, um, you know, just in terms of language, I find it interesting that that um, I feel that we as English, most English speakers, at least myself, that I I know English and you know I speak English fluently and and potentially uh, Spanish a little bit, but 
but you know i'm speaking with other parts of the world and it's amazing how they are multi or trilingual that kind of thing but that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother conversation right but no. but it's interesting that um the brain works in different ways and, and different cultures see different things but one thing that we talked about a lot uh, alan over over the last couple of weeks is is you know i use the term sharp, sharpening the saw and you picked up that that's from uh stephen covey seven habits of highly effective people book and i knew i knew you would know that that's why i said that but ultimately what are some things that people can do maybe who are marketers who are who are content creators who are people who are more businessy people that they can do to uh elevate their creative thinking uh i know you mentioned brainstorming but do you have any ideas for the kind of everyday joe schmoes like me who are just trying to elevate their game uh creating right. content and that kind of stuff Something I created years ago using Yahoo Groups. Mm -hmm. I tried the generic internet, but the trouble with generic internet groups is you get people who know nothing at all. Yeah. And what you're really after are people who know a bunch and maybe those who know a bunch more. Mm -hmm. But those who know a lot don't like groups like that because they're... Every day there's someone going to, you call him Joe Schmo. Let's not pick on Joe. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. the typical person will ask, well, what is creativity? Mm -hmm. We've talked about that for generations. We don't want to talk about that anymore. But that's mm -hmm. what they want to talk about. Well, there needs to be different groups. Well, I came up with the concept using traits of highly creative people. One of my independent studies was I studied four journals, two psychological, two educational, from 1950 to 1980. Had to use card catalogs back in the yeah. dark ages. <laughs> Not Google, Bing, or Yahoo, or any of the other search engines. So I had to do it by hand, along with Reader's Digest to periodic literature. I was looking for the term creative traits wherever I could find it in those four journals from 50 to 80. And I'll tell you why the dates in a moment. And I started making a chart of all these things that I collected. I have literally banker boxes full of what I did during those three months. Mm -hmm. And I put up a one by quarter by one quarter grid graph paper that covered the wall from our front door in married housing all the way to the front door. Mm -hmm. Instead of finding the magic seven, like Stephen Covey chose, mm -hmm. I found 460 by 150 some recognized experts. Well, that depressed me because I was looking for my magic seven, nine, 12, any of the magic numbers, because I had been reading numerology books at the time out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. I was looking for the magic. No, I really wasn't. I was looking for the results. But what I did one day, I walked by one of the habits of a highly intuitive or divergent thinker mm -hmm. is that they see patterns most people don't. You know what? There's got to be a pattern here. What am I going to use to find it? Well, what I decided on, which of which of these 150 some people, at least five of them agreed on any of these traits? Well, that narrowed that 460 some traits to 32. Okay. I chose those 32 and I called them my crayon breaker traits mm -hmm. or just human traits, depending on who I was working with. And I used that around the world for years. And I said, just look at these 32 traits, take three to five minutes and check the ones off that are you in to whatever degree. They don't have to be major. They could just be, yeah, I'm like that at home and I'm like this at work, which in a lot of cases is true. Well, I went around and I found that I almost never found someone without five. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. But then I go into kindergarten teachers and they probably average 25 out of the 32. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I go to bookkeepers, they'd be lucky to average six or seven mm-hmm. if they're bookkeepers, not accountants. <laughs> accountants have a tendency to be more creative than the standard bookkeeper. Yeah. That's a stero- stereotype, but there is some value or truth to that. So I played with that for years and found the results. What I was trying to say, if you write, pick out of that list, you're curious, you're future-oriented, you're flexible, you're fluent, and you think you're more often than not original, good chance you're producing something creatively in some way, like you talk about, in any form of life. The challenge is, You can ask 100 people randomly, anywhere, in any language, the simple question, are you creative? And 60 to 70% of the people would generally say no. And some of them, I don't have a hard number for it, never did. I don't trust hard numbers because I don't do enough research for validity on that. But they usually will say, oh, I can't even draw. I didn't ask them if they could draw, sing, dance, make crafts, I ask, can you create? Once again, the question is the problem. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by being creative? Is Bill Gates creative? Was still Steve Jobs creative? Was Steve Wozniak creative? Was Walt Disney creative? And blah, 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 we can run down the list. In their own way, In the case of Steve Jobs, from my assessment of reading books about him and watching him speak over the years when he was alive, and Walt Disney and Thomas Edison and a few others, they had tendencies to be kind of shoot from the hip at times, but they also wanted it done their way. The directive, it's my way or the highway. That seems to be an, a successful entrepreneur, entrepreneur's way of doing things. Mm-hmm. Lots of great ideas, but now we got to find a way to make it work. Mm-hmm. And one of the books about Walt, it may not have ever been published. It may have been a nightmare or a dream I had that seemed so real I remembered it. The book title was, I Hated Walt So Much I Worked For Him For 25 Years. <laughs> I have searched and searched over the last 30 years trying to find the book and haven't found it. But I found many other books that basically said the same thing. It depended on the time of day. It depended on his mood at the time. Edison was that way. Jobs was that way. And many others. It's their nature. Mm -hmm. But then when I was research, I did a lot of work in the first 10 years with supervisors doing supervisor training. It's the kind of work I could find. Mm -hmm. Uh, Selling creative thinking workshops in a factory just weren't a big success. Right. But institutes at the university, and then one client would recommend me. Um, I made it fun. I make it challenging. They seem to find value in it. And working with factory workers or police officers was easy for me. I don't talk down to people. I don't talk up to people. I may change my vocabulary depending on the person I'm with, Mm -hmm. but I'm not going to talk up or down. It's something I've learned even before I'm Okay, You're Okay, or any of the books by Eric Byrne that were popular in the 80s. But the thing is that there are many traits. I use 52. I use Torrance's from his test, and I use my 32. Mm -hmm. And for 17 years, from 1997 in January until December of 2014, I published a week's worth of, here's how you can develop this trait. Frank, for example, one of the traits that shows up often among certain types of creative people is future-oriented. They always think about how their ideas might impact the world. Mm-hmm. Because one of my premises from the last 40 some years is today's answers create tomorrow's problems because they weren't answers. Mm -hmm. They were ideas that seemed to fit 
And if I use Einstein's statement, then until you know what the problem really was, all you have is an idea. You don't have a solution, but we use them. An the example, one of my father, as an engineer's heroes, was Charles Kettering. Yeah, of Charles, yeah. Yes, yep. out of Ohio. Yeah, I, I he had I, a great studio there until General Motors basically bought him up. Yeah. But what did he give us? Freon. Yeah. Billions of people's lives have been saved by his and his people's creation of Freon. Mm -hmm. But what did Freon do in the 70s and the 80s when the scientists saw it? I don't know. A hole that. in the ozone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which started the climate concern and fear and so forth. Mm -hmm. My belief, based on reading autobiography of Charles Kettering, I have 78 records that my father had. I mean, he really envied this man. He he respected Edison, but he envied Kettering. Um, they created it with Duco paint, paint that dries in five, ten minutes. Painting a car back in the 50s could take days. And one of the story, Kettering stories, whether it's really true or not, it's just a cute story, but it makes the point, which is the purpose of the story, is Kettering was trying to sell the board at General Motors on his experimental paint, mm -hmm. which became Duco paint. And they were kind of hedging. Like a lot of innovative ideas, the boards rarely really support them easily. You got to talk him into it or prove it to him. Mm -hmm. Even Kettering couldn't do that on this one. Well, he took one of the resisting board members out to lunch. And he asked him as he went out, um, what kind of car do you have? And he told him, and he says, if you can have any color you wanted, what color would you want? And I think he probably had color swatches or something. Yeah. They went out to lunch. And they came back. They said goodbye. And he says, well, Ket, we'll talk more about this grant that you're looking for, the money you need for your research. And then he went looking for his car. He couldn't find it. <laughs> it was painted. <laughs> they hadn't moved it except to take it away, paint it, and put it back. Mm -hmm. But it was now the color that the guy asked for mm -hmm. with the Duco paint. That supposedly led to the money that General Motors board gave Kettering to go further with the paint process. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there are thousands of stories in every form of life like that. How dentists do their what they do, orthodontists do what they do. The key is, am I doing it the way it's always been done? Or am I taking a few minutes to go, how else might I do it? In Buffalo at the Creative Problem Solving Institute, one of the things they teach, they have a new version which has been heavily researched. It's a four-step, but I learned the sixth step. And the acronym from that is the two words put together of PISA. Of PISA. What, comes to, what image comes to mind when I say of PISA? The I'm leaning tower of PISA to me. Thank you. <laughs> Most people who have ever seen the tower or been there, remember the Tower of Pisa. Yeah. A useless building that was built on bad land, poorly foundation originally, but it became a multi-million dollar attraction to a little town called Pisa. Mm -hmm. There is history there, but most people have n never seen anything but the tower. And they do all the funny things with the putting their hand on the yeah. top and yeah. holding it up, and which is cute. Well, what the of pieces stands for is objective. Take a few minutes and talk about what are your objectives. What do you need done? What do you need solved? Mm -hmm. And once you've decided on one, whether you're working individually or as a group, then you go, I need to know the facts involved. What do I know? Who, what, when, where, why, how, and any other way you want to generate facts is to get your mind working like a big popcorn machine kind of thing, popping and generating. So you're really focused on the problem. Mm -hmm. The next step is problem finding. So, well, I already have the objective. No, 
how might else you say that? An example I use, and there were others that some of my mentors taught me, but the one I typically use, because it was true from my late wife and I's life. Mm -hmm. we, had, we had to sell one of our cars. We were down to one car when I started traveling all around the United States. Mm -hmm. Because of car accidents I had caused or I had been in, I was fearful or hesitant to ride when someone else drove. Mm -hmm. So I would drive to the airport, which is all the choice we had. We had no van services or anything at that time. Mm -hmm. And the airport in Athens didn't serve much unless you owned a plane and kept it there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one day I had to go to Denver. Well, Mary needed the car. She needed. She had six or seven appointments she had that day as, as a counselor, and mm -hmm. she needed a car. So we drove into Atlanta, and this was back in the dark ages before 9-11 when you could hug people at the gate. Yeah. Yeah, you know, type of thing. And we were still relatively newly married. So we were still hugging almost every time we separated. Yeah. So she go off. I fly away. She goes out in the car. She's got a problem. What uh -oh. might it be? I have the keys. Uh oh. And I, I'm in a plane on the way to Denver. Mm -hmm. I won't arrive for five hours. She needs to be in Athens in an hour and a half. Mm hmm. If she sees her problem is not having the keys, yeah, she can come up with a variety of ideas. Mm -hmm. But one of them is, what if I don't worry about the damn key? I just want to get the car running. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a guy over there breaking into that Cadillac. What if I pay him 10 bucks to break into my car and hotwire it? <laughs> or she says, Alan's done this to me a dozen times this year. I'm going to punish him. I'm going to call Meg, and she's going to pick me up, and I'm going to stay in Atlanta for the next five days and party on his credit card. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. It's yeah. how you look at the problem. Right. But one of the things that, that Sipsy and other conferences and consultants have been teaching is, in what ways might I or in what ways might we do whatever it is we need done? And there are many versions of that. But the goal is don't look for the answer. Look for possibilities. And another one I've learned over the years, whether I read it from someone else or it came to me originally, I don't need to take credit. I take credit for some, but not for yeah. all of them. But I call it elsing. What else can I do? Where else can I do this? When else can I Who else? And so forth. Mm -hmm. The goal is I'm diverging as much as possible before I start converging and then choosing. But I may choose one and go, that's not enough. What can I do to make this a better idea? And now we're looking at multiple levels of thinking. But the key is I can send it to you and you can add it to the tape. You can still access what I call Alan's Creating Challenges. Okay. And you can download a whole year's worth, meaning 52. And what it was is I choose a trait like curio being curious. Mm -hmm. Highly creative people are extremely curious about almost anything. And you say, okay, I want to get my curious muscles going, so to speak, for lack of a better analogy. Well, one is when you go to that dentist appointment, only look at magazines about things you've never looked at before. Mm-hmm. Deliberately go into stores you've never been in before. Mm -hmm. Deliberately go to a toy store and play like you're a five-year-old. Force yourself to be curious because once we get serious and making decent middle class, if there are anybody doing that now, decent incomes, we tend to narrow down our options when in reality we need to expand them. And this last 13 months or 11 months, whatever it's been, has been an example of when all hell breaks loose, Americans become creative. Well, not seeing a lot of Americans being as creative as they could be, but there are a lot who are. Yeah. 
right now. The idea of trying to provide 330 million people with the vaccine shot mm -hmm. when you've got a percentage of them that don't want one. Yeah. You know, we've Lots had that of issue with, needed there. Yeah. Right. You know, how do we sell it? How do we convince them? We may never convince them. We have, this is the land of the free. That's yeah. another topic. We have a whole, anyway, we have, we have next, entire industries. Yeah. We have entire industries that are need to be reinvented right now, especially like the live yeah. events industry. You know, I mean, there's just lots of, uh, uh, issues with, with live events right now, but I love what yeah. you said. Basically, um, Alan, force yourself to be intentionally creative, right? When you said read something different or go. Sometimes around. you need yeah. to. Yeah. Like if you walk around my house, which is filled with books mm -hmm. in many ways, there are at least 12 or 14 subjects. I've worked in eight professions. Mm -hmm. I searched for my ninth one starting in 2006. And then I said, no, I'm going to integrate the other eight because I still like to cartoon. I still like to speak. I still mm -hmm. like to train. I still love passionately architecture. I don't love all architecture, but then I don't love all music either. I like a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. I just failed a 1990s music test uh because I had never heard of the groups. The groups who are still around, like the Stones, yeah. Or the said. BG, or the you know, rather than the BGs, yeah, Maurice, I, think, yeah. I think he's still trying to sing. Um, just because music's not a major part of my life right now, even right. though I've spent thousands of dollars on CDs and so forth, I don't turn them on. I like the sound of birds better. So yeah, we do I have a that. we do have a question, uh, Alan, if you don't mind, from the ah, viewers, uh, Mr. Black. Who do you like as a creative and why? Or who is someone you currently admire? Okay, of today, let's see. And that's from uh, Stylings. Thanks, Stylings, for posting a comment. Yeah, I, I just saw that. A lot of cartoonists. I'm What I'm reaching out on LinkedIn right now is mm -hmm. to try to find cartoonists that I might have been connected with. And I think what I did was I connected with people who are cartoonists who happened to be on LinkedIn. Because even though I've used LinkedIn for 15 years, I don't seem to really know how to use it yet. Mm -hmm. Anyway, a variety of cartoonists. I subscribe to a cartoon service from King Syndicate. I have for several years and I handpick whatever cartoon I want to see. And I see them every day for walloping $30 for the year kind of thing. Architects, some of the architects, uh, I've done presentations about if you can think of it, if you can conceive it, you can build it. Mm -hmm. That's actually been true throughout mankind, but easier in this time. You fly around in Asia and see some unique, you go to London and you see the unique pickle, mm -hmm. you know, and then you all these different buildings. I'm always looking for something that goes beyond normal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Interesting. I have photography friends who are live in England, and their photographs are of the old buildings. I went, I know you've got new buildings somewhere in England. Why don't you photograph <laughs> those? Yeah. Well, that doesn't fit them. You know. And then I have another friend in that same group. I spent a week with he and his wife years ago. He'll photograph white lines on pavement, but no two photographs look the same. Yeah. Chad is like me, he's worked in eight or nine different professions, and he's always challenging himself to do something different. Does that help, Style? I I nod your head or no, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah, I well, I saw your... a photograph here yeah. a minute ago with her name. Yeah, that was just her photo. Yeah, but that's interesting. I think um, I love the fact, too, that you mentioned uh, several different professions, and that is a way that, that you basically you're always challenging yourself for your next thing. That's, a, I think, an important concept for people. Yeah, because in the oh, 80s, just... when I did my dissertation, uh, human style or human thinking styles, actually, it's many different kinds of styles I was looking at. But for the sake to demonstrate that if you match your thinking style to the student's thinking style, to mm -hmm. the way you teach, they'll learn more. 
and that and my dissertation the research went way off the chart number wise hmm. but to me it was common sense mm -hmm. as i mentioned to you earlier when we were just starting i think or maybe in this random discussion if i'm french and only speak french i can't expect the other europeans to understand me mm -hmm. so what we do is we learn each other's language right or as i learned because of a variety of reasons since birth learning language audibly doesn't work for, and i need to see it when you say parlez-vous francais i need to see it ah thank you for your answer um I'll send you a small check later. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, all kidding aside, yeah. there are many people. What, but the thing I did in the 80s after I finished my dissertation, the test I used was by a man named Ned Herman. It's a Herman whole brain instrument. It's a company that's done work around the world and still does to some degree. I'm certified in it. And what he started a journal about whole brain thinking. And I've started writing a series of articles, whole brain architects, whole brain dentist, whole brain this, whole brain that. And what I look for, who were the M's, who were the I's, who were the N's, who were the D's? And I found in every profession or occupation, there are people who are creative in one of those four ways or combinations. Mm -hmm. Even though the stereotype for kindergarten teachers is this warm, loving, hugging. No, there are some that are really dictators and some kids love that. Mm -hmm. So you never know. So my point is to learn what works for you. Absolutely. Wow, this has been a really interesting conversation that has gone in many different ways. Alan, I, I really appreciate you kind of being here with me tonight and, and giving me some insights on creative thinking and and some of the research and information that you have um, collected and created yourself over the years. Um, I think it's interesting that we have a common uh, interest in Kettering. I don't know, interest at least, I just recently went to the Dayton Historical Museum, um, mm. which has a lot, of inf a lot of information in Kettering in Dayton, Ohio. So uh, I was cu very curious, uh, I was curious about his background because I know he's a, a prolific inventor, just like uh, Edison. Um, maybe not quite as many as Edison, but but more modern anyways than Edison. Well, so. medicine, Edison had a bigger studio and mm -hmm. bigger money. Yeah, yeah. All those inventions were not by him. Yeah. They were done by his studio. Right, right. Not to belittle him without his name, yeah. Charles, you know, the various people who worked for him who actually invented many of the things wouldn't have had a place to work. That's like right. if you work at Disney, where else are you going to work on Pixar? Where right. else are you going to work with Jim Henson? Where else are you going to? So yeah. it's his you know, Edison had a lot of foresight too, you know, to create a studio. Yeah. But but yeah, so it's been amazing to talk to you tonight. I look forward to talking to you again in the future with some new ideas and some uh, some new questions that I'll have for you. And um, I look forward to digging into some of this research that you've uh, presented to us tonight, uh, like um, scampering and and uh, thinking toys and stuff like that and some of the patterns that you mentioned as well as your 32 traits that you have on your website. Speaking of a website, uh, Alan, can you give us a little bit of, of information how someone could maybe contact you or find okay. more information about you? I was working with two different website people in the last two days. The one fellow who's been trying to help me for three years create the ideal website for today. <laughs> and I don't know. I still have a lot to learn. I mean, you have a lot you can teach me <laughs> about how to market through social media and so forth. But my basic website I've had since 1990 is just the core of it has changed, but the domain name hasn't. Mm -hmm. It's creating, C-R-E, the number 8, N-G, dot com. Creating dot com. And the website has a lot of material in it, and it links to far more. Mm -hmm. But my concern is, where is that toy? I'm not this generation. <laughs> but each day I try to learn something new. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's still a telephone. <laughs> you know? But this yeah. thing can do a hundred times what my father's giant computer used to do in the 50s. Right. But anyway, it didn't go that direction. But 
I have other websites. If people will write to me, it's alan at creating.com. I will always answer your question or find someone I believe that can. Excellent. Because that is one thing I definitely have done successfully over the last 40 years has been a connector with people of, in, in, who have interest in the things I have interest in. In the media, the internet and the web have been perfect tools for me. Yep. I love the term connector. I know I try to, I try to put the right people together too. I think yeah, a, you certainly did that with the conference that I experienced. <laughs> yeah, last yeah month. That, that's a that's Those how you get a lot of value. Five people were quite a rich collection of people. Yeah, that it was a, a big undertaking that was a well worth the investment. But um, yeah, the January hit like a freight train, happened that the first uh, two days of the year. But uh, but it's been great, Alan. Thank you, thank you again for doing this with me tonight. Uh, I think it's about time to sign off. Everyone watching the live stream, uh, be sure to check out our other uh, content endeavors. So go to contentacademy.com if you'd like to learn more about the uh, content creation that we create. Be sure to check out my podcast at blogyouwant.com. I'm excited to announce I have a new interview scheduled for that really soon. And then if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, be sure to hit the little bell to make sure that you get notifications of our upcoming videos. And also be sure to check out um, some of the videos that are on the channel. Some of those creative year ever videos are starting to leak out to the channel. So be sure to watch them. And Alan, you, you have one more thing to say? Yeah, I have my channel I've had for several sure. years, but I don't know how well to manage it like you do. Another <laughs> thing that maybe you can help me. It's sure. just Robert, Robert Alan Black with spaces between the name channel. And there are like 200, 200 videos on it. Excellent. Haven't we'll hit, fi have hit 5,000 subscribers yet, but uh, do we'll write it. Too, Scott yeah. just asked. So when you find it, subscribe. Yeah, we will link to that in the episode. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're here to have fun every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Central Time, Creative Life. We talk about all types of things that are important to being a creator, a content creator, a content marketer, a content developer, being the best version of yourself, like Robert was mentioning tonight, or I'm sorry, Alan, I, I'm seeing Robert. I'm looking e at Robert. Either, so Robert. either yeah. one. I'm the one that created that monster. So <laughs> Alan, I was sitting here with Alan. Obviously, being a creator starts with yourself and your own mind. And ultimately, that's why I like to have Creative Year Ever as a way to start, kick off the year. We're well into it now. Be sure to check out creativeyearever.com if you'd like to get access to the videos that were played during the summit. And that's all I've got for tonight. Alan, thanks again. Everyone watching, go on, create, and we'll see you next week. Bye for now. Bye-bye.